Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from HowToDrawComics.net and welcome to another comic art tutorial. In this video, we are going to be continuing on with Goliath, a character that I designed for Rob Arnold's Replicator comic book series. Now at this point, we have completed a majority of Goliath's character sheet. Uh, actually, I would say half of it, maybe. I'm being a little bit optimistic there by saying most of it. There's still a few diagrams, a few illustrations that I need to do up of Goliath from varying points of view in order to get a proper, wholesome understanding of exactly how his design fits together from each of the major primary viewpoints. And in this particular demo, what we are going to be looking at is how Goliath's design appears from the top-down three-quarter back view. Now, this is oftentimes, for many artists, an extremely difficult point of perspective to draw their characters on. Now, why is that? Well, it's because drawing characters from behind is just kind of a foreign point of view to, to draw them on. You know, oftentimes we're looking at our characters in the three-quarter view or the front view. These are the most common points of perspective that we draw our character on. And so we don't really get a whole lot of practice drawing them from the back and more importantly, how their anatomy should fit together from behind. You know, the back muscles, I have to say, I am much more unfamiliar with than I am the muscles that reside on the front of a character. You know, I know where the pecs and abdominal muscles sit down the torso at the front of a character. I know how the arms need to look from the front and from the sides. And yeah, sure, from the back, same with the legs. I know how the head and the neck should look from the front. But when it comes to the back, not only can I not name the muscles within the back, but there's just a complex system of muscle groups that must be remembered just as accurately as the muscles in the front view if you want to have a, the reassurance that your character is indeed drawn properly, that your audience isn't going to look at it, spot out mistakes, and ridicule your, uh, your, your inexperience as an artist. And that can happen. People are harsh, especially when you put these character designs out there on social media, trying to get feedback. You're trying to do a good thing. I love putting character designs out there for people to check out, for them to give me their thoughts, their feedback, their suggestions. But let me tell you, they are very, very quick to criticize, and they won't hold back, especially in this day and age. You know, people are hiding behind a computer screen. They're uh, the keyboard warriors, you might have heard them referred to as. And look, there is trolls out there that will simply tear your art to pieces without giving it, without giving you in return any real advice that you can apply to your artwork that would improve it. They're just there really to make themselves feel better by bringing you down. And, you know, sometimes your art doesn't even need to be that bad for this to occur. You know, people are assholes sometimes. It sucks to hear that. And uh, it's unfortunate that those types of people are out there. But uh, look, even my art... And I'm not saying that my art is perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I know that just like any other artist, I've got work to do. I've got to make sure that I'm constantly on top of my comic art game because I get rusty from time to time. I'm not always, you know, sitting at the drawing board 100% switched on. Sometimes I get lazy. And I lose focus. I'm not paying attention to what it is I'm doing. I become complacent. And uh, yeah, complacency is, is one of the worst things. Because the thing with complacency is you can have the skill set there. 
You can have the ability to draw. You can be perfectly fine in terms of your understanding of proportions, anatomy, and all the, the fundamental drawing principles that you need to know about in order to be able to come up with something that looks great on the page. But here's the thing. You become complacent. You become lazy. And all of a sudden, that doesn't matter because you just can't be bothered applying what you've learned for all those years in order to come up with the most the best presentation that you could possibly come up with. You know, it takes effort. No matter what point you're at within your artistic journey, you're always going to have to put effort in. That's part of the fun. I mean, it keeps you engaged. That's why I'm still drawing. You know, I, I got to pay attention. I love escaping from the, the everyday woes of life into my artwork. And if it wasn't there keeping me engaged, then, you know, it wouldn't really serve that purpose at all. I'd be still stuck with the problems that I've got to put up with. But at least drawing it gives me something else to focus on, to pay attention to. And I'm able to sink into that for a few hours and leave my problems behind. Of course, you always got to come back down to earth at some point, back to reality, and uh, and face the music. But, uh, you know, yeah, drawing is a great escape for me. And it's a productive escape. You know, some people, they really love to... Uh, to go out and hit the bar and have a few drinks with their buddies to blow off steam. I, uh, I used to do that really up until recently. You know, I'm 30 now, so I've got to slow down a little bit. <laughs> I've got to maintain my health. And uh, for those who are older out there that might be watching this video, you're probably wondering, Clayton, what are you talking about? You're only 30. You're, you're, still, a, you're still a young spring chicken. But, <laughs> you know, you, you get older and you've got to make sure that you start becoming more conscious, at least, of your health. And so, you know, rather than going out and drinking and, and partying to ignore my troubles in life, I kind of get back to the drawing board. Some people like to play video games, and, you know, that's all good and well. But the thing is, is that it's not productive. You, you really don't get anything out of doing that. It's kind of a waste of time, literally. It's just mindless entertainment. Of course, there are educational video games out there that are supposed to, you know, increase your reflexes and whatnot. And I guess first-person shooters, which I really used to love to play. You know, I was a big, I was a big Counter-Strike guy back in the day. In fact, probably haven't played a game since Counter-Strike Source came out. Uh, but you know, I mean, I the thing with uh, with first-person shooters, I guess they they help you to they, they teach you to aim and and to become more coordinated. I mean, heck, if you've never played a first-person shooter, one thing that uh, that always happens to me if I haven't played in a while, if I'm out of practice, is I will be absolutely lost. I'll be looking all over the place, at the ceiling, at the floor. I won't be able to walk in the direction that I want to walk in. I'm the worst on consoles. And, uh, and you know... I'm so lost throughout the map. Like, I have no idea where I am, how to get out of where I am, where I'm supposed to go. It's a, it's a total nightmare for me. So I stick to drawing because, again, I, I get something out of it. At the end, I can look at a finished piece of artwork and boom, you know, I've been able to enjoy my time. I've been able to, again, put those problems on hold that I might be dealing with. Sometimes I'm just putting my chores on hold. <laughs> I'm like anybody else. I've got to, you know, do my washing. I've got to, you know, make sure the house is, is clean and uh, that, you know, I'm not, I'm not living like a complete grub. But uh, I tell you what, if I can put that on hold in order to get some drawing done, I certainly will. Drawing is a great excuse for me to do that. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's one of those things. So let's take a look at exactly what is happening on the screen in front of us. You can see that I've I've sketched out a, a very loose representation of Goliath's anatomy from the back. The hardest part is done, folks. All I've got to do is really go over the top of what I've got there. I've got to clean up that line work, make sure it's polished, make sure it's looking slick, sharp, and energetic. Uh, you can see that I've got one of the primary design elements that the back view of this character needs to have, which is his his ammo cartridge, his, I guess his ammo uh, box that he's got strapped to his back. And I'm trying to do something a little bit interesting here. You can see that I haven't just strapped it on his back. It's kind of, it's it's got these me <coughs> these mechanical attachments almost that 
connect into you know his trapezius mu- trapezius muscles at the back of his neck there connects to the back of his head and into you know his undies around where he the top of his bum is <laughs> and and around the sides of his body you can see that the the mechanical attachments kind of go inside his skin a little bit now, of course, the ammo box is where the ammo belts from the miniguns are going to attach to. So again, I got to think about the gestural coil that the minigun ammo belt is going to follow as it runs out of the miniguns and up into that ammo cartridge, that ammo, that ammo backpack that he's wearing. And I've tried to make that backpack look as techy as possible. I want to make it look futuristic. I want to give it that ultra cool factor, as I always try to do when it comes to my character concepts. And I'm just keeping everything loose at this point in time. Yeah, it's it's kind of tight. I've I've made sure that all the placement of the major muscle groups that we're looking at from this point of view are positioned and proportioned correctly. You know, again, this is the blueprint here. I've got to make sure that there is some stability to it before I start going over the top. Otherwise, the whole design will just fall apart. It'll suffer the same fate that every drawing that doesn't have a sound da- sound foundation uh, suffers, which you know means it's it's going to it's going to collapse on itself. This, the, those fundamental problems will be present from the beginning as they will be present to the end if they are not fixed in the uh, in the initial phases of the drawing. So you got to cross-check this stuff really, really early on. Why? Because if you don't, you're going to end up putting in a ton of work and time on top of a flawed foundation. And if the foundation is flawed, then it really does mean all that detail is not going to help you out. And that you got to essentially go back to the drawing board. It really, really sucks when that happens. And these errors really do just kind of swoop in under the radar. You don't see them coming sometimes. So what I try to remember to do, which I haven't done here, unfortunately, is I, I flip the canvas horizontally. Right? I, I make sure that I look at it in a mirror perspective so I can get that, that fresh set of eyes on it without having to ask someone else to come into the room and, and uh, tell me their thoughts. I would do that, but the thing is, is, you know, being an artist, you develop a very keen eye, a keener eye than the average spectator. And so, you know, you might ask your, your mum or your dad or your, your friend or your partner to come in and look at your drawing. And the chances are is that if it's halfway decent, they're going to say, dude, it looks absolutely amazing. It's brilliant. They're not going to have the fine-tuned visual awareness that you may need in order to spot the finite mistakes. Now, you might ask yourself, well, hey, if they're finite, why bother fixing them? Well, because, you know, it's it might be a small little adjustment that makes the, a small little amount of difference, but uh, it all does count in the end. And let me tell you another thing. It also makes you a much better artist as well. You know, when you put the effort into finding those mistakes and really, really being uh, put, putting your 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 artwork under a certain amount of scrutiny when you're working with it, uh, it really does make you more aware, keenly aware, I would say, and lead to much better outcomes most of the time. And isn't that what you want? Don't you want to be the best artist that you possibly can be? I mean, why bother drawing if you don't? That's the way I see it. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to go all the way. I'm all in, baby. Like, I want to make sure that I'm I'm putting every single thing, every ounce of effort that I possibly can into each piece of artwork that I set out to do. Now, it might be for a client. It might be for myself. Sometimes it's a little bit easier with clients. Oddly enough, I seem to scrutinize my artwork way more when it's for me. And so those pieces take so much longer because I'm more invested, I would say. You know, when you... And it's not to say that you shouldn't be invested in the work of your clients that they're paying you especially. You do want to make sure that you're putting in every amount of effort that you possibly can with them, as I did for Rob with Goliath here. But 
I don't know. There's just you become very judgy, very judgmental of your own stuff as an artist. At least that's the case for me and many others that I have talked to about uh, this. These little dilemmas that we most of us share a lot of the time, and the way in which I try to manage that, I would say, because you don't want to get around it. It can serve you in a lot of ways. I think that you don't want to be too hard on yourself though, because if there does come a point where it becomes unproductive and you end up throwing artwork out that was actually perfectly fine, like it was good. And I think you can almost, you can hypnotize yourself either way. You can hypnotize yourself into thinking that it's great and it looks good, or you can hypnotize yourself into thinking that it's terrible and absolutely bad. And the thing is, is that you can only really tell the truth of that a few days later, when you've stepped back from it a little bit, when you've had some time to separate yourself from that project, from that illustration that you have been working with. And you have to do that sometimes because you get a little bit heady if you're working too closely for an extended, elongated period of time. And that can be just something that is debilitating as an artist. If you don't step back and you keep on just freaking yourself out, breaking your your mind and, and your energy and your focus on little minuscule tiny details that you, you don't, you're not really fixing anything, you're just tweaking it for the sake of tweaking it, and then you're overworking it, which is even worse. You know, you're fixing things that don't need to be fixed, and the act of fixing or thinking that you're fixing them is actually doing more bad than good for the drawing that you've already created. That's when you're in a real spot of trouble. And it is when you need to just, hey, chill, relax, move on to something else, leave it for a while, come back to it later. And what you will find is something very surprising. Most of the time, you'll discover that, hey, you know what? That wasn't all that bad. That was pretty good, actually. Or uh, if you're more unlucky than that, you may come back to it and go, oh, man, that's what was I thinking? That's terrible. That's shite. And uh, you'll have to redo it because you just won't be able to live with it. <laughs> At least that's the way it works for me. You know, if I come back and I look at an artwork that I thought was great initially, but then I realize, wow, you know, that character's left arm is completely out of whack as far as proportion, its proportions are concerned, uh, then i got to fix it. i got to erase that entire arm as an example and just start again. And, you know, but most of the time that's not the case. Usually I come back and I'm like, hey, that's nowhere near as bad as I thought it was. What was, what was I freaking out about? And the thing that you have to understand is it depends on your state of mind a lot of the time as to how you interpret the work that you have done, as to how you feel about it. Now, if you're tired and, you ha and you're not well rested, maybe you, know, you haven't hit the gym in a while, so you feel kind of crappy physically, which tends to make you feel kind of crappy mentally, that's going to paint a certain perspective that you have, not only on your artwork, but just life in general, <laughs> you know, nothing will feel like it's going the way that you want it to. So that's why they say getting a bit of rest, going for a nap even, just a nap or a walk. It helps to clear your head and it allows you to come back with an unbiased point of view as to what it was previously that you were working on. So, uh, you know, you, you sometimes you just you, you get too involved in your own stuff and, and you got to make sure that you distance yourself when that happens. You've got to recognize that it's happening as well. So as you can see, I'm going right in over the top of that little sketchy blueprint that I did up before. And I'm trying to make the line art much cleaner, much sleeker here. This is kind of more like the line art that I would probably use for a finished comic book illustration or interior. So, you know, previously the concepts that I had done for Rob, they were a little rougher than Goliath here. And that, and as a result, Goliath took much, much longer than they did. You know, Rob was like, where is Goliath? 
Clayton, you know, what's taking so long with this guy? And when I sent it to him, he understood uh, why it took so long. And it's because I, you know, I really, uh, for some reason, Goliath was just a, an important character to me that I knew deserved the amount of attention and energy that I put into his concept. He needed it. He required it. I knew that he was an important character to Rob as well. And I wanted to do a good job. I wanted to blow Rob away. I wanted to impress him, as I do with any of my clients. And half the time these days, that's why I don't take on too much client work. One, I don't have the time to do it, especially working on uh, Renegade Alpha now which if you don't know, is my upcoming comic book. I've been putting out a few character concepts for that. Make sure you check it out on the YouTube channel if you haven't already seen those demos because they're pretty cool. Uh, but besides that, you know, I mean, it's it's one of those things where I want to make sure that I'm putting in as much effort as, impossible, as, as possible because I want to impress my clients. You know, I, I never want them to be disappointed in the work that I've done for them. Heck, I'd rather do it for free than for that to happen. So I always want to make sure that they're happy with that end product that I'm delivering to them. So I'm going through, I'm adding in this cleaned up line art over the top of the minigun. It's a very, you know, miniguns, hard surfaced objects and elements. They're, they're very technical in the way in which you lay their contours down onto the page. You're talking very straight lines, very sharp lines. So you got to have an extremely steady hand if you intend to lay those lines in freehand and a lot of the time I do challenge myself to do that without aid because I think that it just makes me a much more well-rounded artist. I'd never like to depend on you know additional tools uh, in, in order to be able to be the artist that I am. I want to be able to draw a straight line freehand without being dependent on a ruler, as an example. I just hate being dependent on anything, in all honesty. I want to do it all myself. And that works against me sometimes, but it also works for me. The ways in which it works against me is it takes me a heck of a lot longer to do things. If I brought on board the services of a colorist that I trusted, of an inker that I knew could do a good job, and recently I have done that with Jimmy Reyes. I've worked with him a little bit. He's he's done a little bit of uh, inking for me on uh, one of my characters for Renegade Alpha called Beretta. She's a really cool character. I love designing her. But, you know, I, I went out there. And I thought, hey, let's see. Let's see what happens if I do give someone else a chance to help me in the process of realizing my vision. And it can really cut the amount of production time that you're spending on a single illustration, you know, in, in half, in thirds sometimes. Uh, it can cut out two thirds of the, the whole operation if you're lucky. And that allows you to get more done. And who doesn't want to get more done? Who doesn't want to do more illustrations? Who doesn't want to do more, more cover art, more concepts, more interiors? You know, I mean, why not? But uh, again, I'm just, I'm not that trusting sometimes. And I'm a control freak. That's my problem. I'm a big old control freak. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm learning to let go a little bit and uh, not bottleneck myself so much. <laughs> so um yeah you know that's a word to the wise uh, let go sometimes there are, are th there's a good chance that there's someone out there that can ink better than you if your main discipline is penciling and if your main discipline is inking maybe there's someone out there who's a better penciler that you could employ the services of and of course if you're if there's a colorist, if your your main discipline isn't coloring, then there's probably a colorist out there that can do a heck of a job for you. So why not pass us some of the load? I mean, of course, you need finances. You can't just ask these these wonderful, talented, especially talented people to work for free. Uh, you do have to, you know, oftentimes, if you want to get good talent on board, you got to fork out a little bit of dosh. But, you know, if you are able to do that, it can be substantially productive for you in terms of cutting back your workflow time and uh, it's something that I highly suggest uh, that I and it's advice that I'm not really taking myself and I really should be 
Um, but hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a one man show sometimes, and it's my own damn fault if it if it takes me a lot longer to produce something than than I would like. So I'm going in and I'm dropping in some shadows again, trying to describe the back of Goliath's anatomy as closely and as accurately as I possibly can to how it should look in reality. Because it doesn't matter whether you're looking at a character from the back or behind, people can still tell intuitively whether or not you have drawn it and structured it and sized it up correctly. They just can. They don't need to be professors in anatomy. They don't need to be, you know, a doctor or, uh, or you know, and an, 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 another, another fellow artist. <laughs> they can just be a normal average person. And the thing is, is that the reason that they're able to be able to tell whether or not something looks off is because we're all human. We see people every single day on the street, on the bus. We see them at the beach. We're accustomed to analyzing and observing other people. And we have to be, you know, if we weren't good observers of other people, we'd be running into all sorts of trouble. You know, we look at their body language to suss out whether or not they're nervous, whether or not they're dangerous, whether or not they're approachable and friendly. And we make judgment calls based on their anatomy, based on their body type, based on what they're wearing. And a lot of the time, that all comes down to biology, yo. Like, that's just the way in which we work. And it's important that we make sure that we acknowledge those important parts of our biology because, again, that's what's helped us to survive to, uh, to this point in time within our, our history as human beings. That's what's allowed us to evolve this, to this point. And uh, if we didn't take on board and acknowledge and make good use of these biological distinctions that we make on a subconscious level, then, uh, you know, we probably would have been bashed over the head by a rock thrown from a fellow caveman who just, you know, wanted our grapes or whatever. <laughs> wanted to steal our, our wife, uh, wives. You know, I don't know how cavemen worked. I don't know what their social structure was like, but I assume that they just took what they wanted um, and uh, and beat up whoever they could to get it. But you know, like that's that's the thing. We we got to We we would have had to once upon a time been able to tell whether or not trouble was coming, and especially whether or not it was going to come from another human being or another Neanderthal, right? So we've we've got a very highly attuned understanding of people and their anatomy and the way in which they move, their silhouette, their shape, their height, their, their, their weight, right? So even if they're not artists that are looking at your artwork, they're going to be able to tell whether or not there's something off, whether or not there's, there's little errors littered within your artwork. So you've got to make sure that they're ironed out, that they're not there anymore. And again, this can be very difficult because when we're drawing characters from behind, you know, a lot of us, as I said, we have a vague idea as to how the structure of the human body needs to fit together when we're looking at it from behind. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we have a clear, sharp, high-resolution understanding of how the back muscles, how the, the leg muscles from behind, the arm muscles, and, and the neck muscles are all attached together. You know, again, a lot of this stuff is stored symbolically in our minds on a subconscious level. So thinking about it logically doesn't always work. But when somebody is taking in our drawings, you have to remember they're not taking it in logically a lot of the time. It's an experience for them. And that's what you're creating always when it comes to art. You're creating an experience. Never forget that. 
And so they're not taking it in logically, but on a subconscious level, they can spot all those mistakes. It's their subconscious that's telling them that there's something off. But you as the artist, you've got to think in logical terms because you're the one putting this together. You've got to really analyze and become conscious of, think about exactly how everything needs to look. And you can see here that I just erased Goliath's legs. I've completely redrawn them because for one reason or another, they just weren't looking the way in which I wanted them to look. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, these things happen. You got to start from the drawing board again. And you could, you could see there, by the way, that I had outlined those legs. I had placed in the shadows and then get out the eraser, completely get rid of everything. Why? Because, you know, I probably just didn't like one, uh, one little part of it. And so, you know, unfortunately, you've, you've got to just, when you do see those, those errors within your work, regardless of the amount of time you've spent thus far, you got to go back and fix it. Now, this clearly is a perspective issue that I am facing right now, that I am trying to overcome. These obstacles, they pop up before you all the time. And you've got to, you've got to hop over those hurdles. You at least try your best to. I always say that a lot of the time, being a good comic book artist is just being a good problem solver because it's not that difficult to draw a line down on the page. To get something down onto the page just requires you to move your pencil and to let some lead come out against the surface. But, uh, you know, getting it to be shaped in the correct way, applying the correct amount of line weight in order to emphasize the right amount of form, that's the hard part. Making sure that all the technical considerations that are required to be made have indeed been made in order to make sure that your, your artwork, what it is you're depicting, the subject matter, is presented with the same understanding that you have of it to your audience so that they also understand it in the same way. You're visually communicating an idea here. In other words, when I go ahead and I draw in this, this ammo backpack onto the back of Goliath, I got to make sure that the audience understands that that is where the ammo for the minigun is coming from. That's where it's stored. You know, so I've got this, it, it almost looks as though just looking at the side of that, that, that ammo pack, that it's, it, it's um, I guess, looped around a wheel within the backpack, and it just kind of slides out there. And I've tried to make sure that I've depicted that, that I've suggested it as, as much as possible. And even though I've completely made up the design of this ammo cargo container, uh, it, there's still certain mechanical attributes that I've tried to imply within it that uh, suggests its functionality. In other words, how it works, how it dispenses the ammo as the ammo belts run into the minigun and then, you know, shoot the bullets. All right? Everything kind of has to has to make sense, really, at the end of the day. That's all I'm saying here. It's a, it's a very complex way of saying that things that you're drawing just need to make sense to your audience. Otherwise, I mean, it's a bad drawing. It's a bad design. If, if your audience is looking at your character design and they're scratching their head, they're like, what is it that I'm looking at here? What is it that you're trying to show me? If they've got to ask questions then that means you haven't done your job as a designer very, very well. It means it's a bad design, right? Because all a design is, is it's an aesthetic, yes, but it's also a representation of certain elements and subject matter that are composed together in a pleasing way that makes sense, that, that people understand, that people get. I mean, it's, it's the concept, right? And really, the design should serve the concept. It should convey it. It should communicate it in a visual manner. So, you know, there's a lot to be a, a good character designer. It is very fun. Don't get me wrong. I, I really, really love character design. And one of the things I love about it is working out all these little problems, all these, uh, all these little kinks 
it, it's again like drawing it's like problem solving you you've got to make sure that you embrace that fact and that you not only embrace it but you also enjoy the process of working out all those problems and sometimes you will reach a wall within the development of your own design and you'll be sitting there thinking man how do i get how do i get around this you know you'll be you could be you could waste a whole day trying out different options trying to figure it out like what what is the direction that i need to go in here in order to solve this damn puzzle in order to figure out where this particular puzzle piece needs to go in order to complete the picture and uh, and you just got to work through it you just got to stick with it sometimes the reason that something is not working is because it doesn't belong there maybe you've come up with an idea for your character design that may work for a different character but doesn't work for this particular one and your expectations do need to be adjustable don't be so married don't be so attached to your initial idea because the the chances are is that it's going to evolve it's going to shift and change the design process the drawing process itself it's very organic in nature it's it's not set in one way it's definitely not binary it's not black or white there's a lot of gray area in fact and so you've got to be able to work with the flow of the design process work with your own creativity and listen to that artistic intuition that you know you've got it's always going to be there advising you in one way or another and sometimes you'll resist that advice sometimes you'll be like no i've got to make this work <laughs> but the thing is that you know if you if you're so stubborn that you don't let yourself shift and change direction when need be well you just you'll end up with a concept that was confined to your initial expectation which may not be the best possible outcome you could have ended up with you, that that requires trust in yourself to to really let go and to really just let your creativity off the leash and let it roam around letting it find its own place uh, that can be a, a very challenging thing. It, re it requires a lot of trust within yourself. Believe that you're a good concept artist. Believe in that artistic intuition, that intuition that you have for what looks good, for what makes a great-looking design. And you may surprise yourself. You, you may be absolutely boggled by where you end up. Now, uh, luckily, when it gets to this point within any character sheet, you've already got a majority of the primary character concept down. Like, we know what Goliath looks like from the three-quarter view, straight up and down, head to toe. We understand how he looks from the front, how he looks from the side, at least partially. We've also got that close-up view of his face. So we've got the details worked out there from that particular point of view. But now that we've moved on to the back view, even though we're dealing with completely different elements that we haven't worked out the design of yet, we at least know what those elements are going to be. We know that he needs somewhere that the ammo is coming from. Obviously, that's going to be an ammo container. Well, then again, maybe not so obviously, because initially, before I actually sketched up this design and I shared it out there, people asked me, you know, where do the bullets come from? Does he have an ammo container strapped to his back? Do they come from the inside of his body? And I was like, what? You're telling me that you think this guy's just full of ammo? That's not why he's so big. He's just, he's just fully jacked because, you know, he never misses a day at the gym. <laughs> Actually, I don't know why he's so big, why he's able to wield dual miniguns on either arm. Uh, you'll have to ask Rob that one. He's, you know, I assume he's some kind of experiment, some kind of uh, mutated form of weaponry that is used to search out and destroy any targets that uh, that may be required for ex for extermination, you know. 
Um, so yeah, like I mean, I don't, I don't know, but Rob wanted this dude to to look a certain way, and I had to make sure that I fulfilled his wishes as closely as possible, but almost, but also as awesomely as possible. You know, because you don't just you don't just want to make sure that you've included all the primary elements within a design that needs to be there. It also has to be represented in an interesting, visually engaging, visually energetic and enticing manner. And, uh, you know, otherwise, I mean, you could take any design. You could take Goliath's design right here, just the way I've got it. And you could draw it up in the most boring way possible, and it would really look boring. It doesn't matter how well designed it is, the presentation goes a really, really long way. If you're good at presentation, you can take a, a, a shitty looking design and you can paint it very, very beautifully in, again, a visually enticing way. Or you can take a good concept, one that looks fantastic, one that's flawless, and uh, give it to an artist that isn't so good at representing that design, representing character designs really at all, and uh, you know it will do a disservice to it. It simply won't do, create a, a proper representation of that character, at least the best representation that it that it could have been presented in. So I'm adding in some rendering to his legs. I've done that for his arms. Again, we're bringing Goliath's back view diagram here to an exceptionally finished and polished level. This is exactly how I would illustrate him in Replicator if I was on the book. And trust me, at one point, Rob really, really wanted me to, to get more involved with this book. Um, again, unfortunately, my, my schedule's just chock a block right now so um you know i had to i had to just promise that i'd be able to do this concept for him and that that much i would be able to to do i would be able to lend my services for um so i'm giving him a chromium butt uh he's a bit of a bubble butt this guy you can see uh that i've i've tried to produce a very reflective metallic surface uh surface there on each one of his cheeks um, you know, it emphasizes the forms, that's for sure. It draws more attention to his backside. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I mean, it, again, it looks cool. It still looks really, really cool, and it does get the the part of the concept across clearly, that part being the material that the surface of his underwear is, is covered with. And, you know, it is, it is some kind of metallic underwear. It's like a... I don't know, a high-tech chastity belt for Goliath? <laughs> Maybe it's a good thing he's wearing it, uh, you know, but... And, uh, you know, he's got these little little connection points at the sides there around his hips where the, where the leg joins onto the torso, trying to indicate some mobility there. Uh, I don't want to just have a piece of metal wrapping around his groin, his, his pelvis, that uh, doesn't allow him to move his legs. That wouldn't be good. He's got to be able to, you know, run after enemies, uh, run after opponents that he's he's trying to exterminate there with his mini guns. So he's got to he's got to be capable of a wide range of movement. Now he probably be he probably moves really really slowly. I mean, when you look at his size, he's he's a huge dude. He's probably not all that elegant either with his movements. So, you know. Uh, it's probably if you came up against this guy, put it that put it this way, you, you'd want to be running in the opposite direction or real quick, going over the top of these minigun ammo belts now, emphasizing the primary contours that I've used to define them with some thicker line weights. Line weights are brilliant because they really do allow you to pop certain elements out of the page. And it's great when you're able to do that because it creates this additional level of depth and I mentioned in the drawing, it allows you to pull the audience in further and uh, it allows those viewers to engage on a much deeper level. You're always trying to pull them into the page. The last thing you want is a flat looking drawing, especially with a, a viewpoint like this. You know, the back view of a character isn't exactly the most riveting point of view that you could present them on. So you've got to pick up the slack a little bit for the disinterest that's going to be associated with it. Who wants to look at a character's back, right? So you have to make it interesting enough for them to pay attention. Now, again, this isn't really for the wider audience. This is 
going to be the concept sheet that is really only going to be used by the interior artist of the book or the cover artist that may be including Goliath within the the, the composition. So, you know, it's not for... It, I mean, it can be used as promotional material. It is actually being used as promotional material here on uh, in the video, you know, as I draw it up for you guys. So... You know, I mean, it really just depends. But a lot of the time, concept art, unfortunately, it's never released to the public. All those big movie productions, all these big uh, video game productions that you see, like 90% of the cool, badass concept artwork that's done up for those productions is never released. You never get to see it. And the really sucky part about that is... Because the artists who work on those projects have to sign NDA, NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, it means that they don't get to include that content within their portfolio afterwards either. So it really, really sucks. And, uh, you know, you just never know what high-profile artists are beholden to NDNA, NDAs out there. That's how you pronounce it, not NDNA. <laughs> My goodness. So, uh, yeah, I mean, these ammo belts were just killer. Like, they were one of the most time-consuming elements that I included in this design. And they had to be there because it was a it was a prerequisite des defined by Rob. Like, he, he wanted those ammo belts to be included within the design. So I said, all right, Rob, we'll do it. And uh, I did, but it took me a while. And it took me longer than I wanted. I mean, it's just an ammo belt, right? Like, you would think that Goliath himself would have taken much more time. But I know, it was those ammo belts. Because of the level of intricacy and detail that's within them. I mean, look at the darn thing. Look at them both. They've got so many lines. They've got rendering in them. They've got a ton of primary contour lines that I've included. Man, I mean, you couldn't get a more complex detail element that's not the primary focus of the design itself. So now we're on to the MO backpack. You can see how much room that actually takes up, how much real estate it occupies on the back viewpoint of Goliath. And the process that I go through each and every time as I jump from one element to the next is I go over the top of it with weighted lines. I try to define that outline as, you know, in the most polished visual sense that I possibly can. And then after that, it's time to render it out. And I try to define the forms by describing the surface, every single surface throughout that element, as the hatches follow along the, its dimensions. You know, you can see that those hatches that I'm adding in around the ammo cartridge right now, they're not just running in a random direction. They're actually running along it, along each face that I'm drawing them upon. I'm adding in a few texture details here and there, or I will, uh, in order to describe the material that this ammo uh, backpack is made of. I want to give it a, a rustic metal appeal. <laughs> So, uh, you know, uh, Goliath, he's he's got to look as though he's been through a few battles. That's, uh, that's definitely something I want to make sure I get across to the viewer. He's uh, He involves himself in a lot of conflicts. He's uh, not somebody to be messed with. He's not going to stand on the sidelines. He'll be right amid the action. He'll be amongst it. <laughs> and and uh, let me tell you, he'll be causing a lot of carnage while he's there. I just love big, muscular, badass-looking characters like this. They're some of the most fun characters that I ever get to design. And they look really, really cool in the comic book as well. Like, you can imagine this dude running around from in the paneled pages of Replicator and how that's going to look as the sequences play out, especially the action sequences with this guy. Can you imagine it? I mean, he's just going to be causing mass amounts of destruction, breaking shit, breaking other characters, ruining them with those miniguns. It's going to be absolute chaos. And uh, I really can't wait to see him. Now, I know he's going to be 
I don't know if he's going to be in Replicator 3. I'll have to ask Rob that. I certainly am sure that he'll be in Replicator 4, though, if he's not in Replicator 3. But, uh, you know, Rob did ask me to do up these concepts. So I'm assuming that the reason he got me to do the concept for Goliath was because of his upcoming issue of Replicator, which is issue 3. So that'll be in the next book. And let me tell you, the next book is looking really, really good. Rob has tracked down a fantastic artist who is very capable of representing his idea, his story, in the visual medium of a comic book very, very well. He's a, he's an exceptionally talented dude. And then he's also got an equally talented colorist and inker on board. Jimmy Reyes would be the inker there to uh, to to wrap it all up, to, to make sure that the presentation of this book is of the best quality that it possibly can be. I'm personally really super excited and invested in this project. Why? Because I did the characters. And let me tell you, there is no more rewarding feeling than seeing the characters that you designed, that you defined the look of, represented by another artist in a finished project. It is just the coolest thing in the world. It's one of the best parts about being a concept artist on a project like Replicator, or like a video game, like any other comic book, like a movie. I mean, it's it's so, so cool. And the thing is, like, everybody is working from these designs. So it's kind of an important job. It's known as the pre-production phase of any project. That's when the con- the concept artist comes on board, is during those initial stages. So now I'm adding in some cross hatches. You can see how detailed I'm getting here. Uh, again, I'm working from a bit of a distance, making sure I've got a good, wholesome look at the back of Goliath's figure as a whole. Because, you know, if you don't have that, then you're going to get caught up in the details. You're going to lose track of exactly how the various tones and values are reading. They've got to read from a distance. Otherwise, it just becomes a visually indecipherable mess on the page and uh, you don't want that especially for a complex looking character like Goliath yes there's going to be detail there but that detail should be contrasted strategically with the lack of detail that that design also possesses you got to play the lack of detail off of the increased amount of complex intricate detail that you include within it because, uh, yeah, as I said, if you don't, it'll just flatten out the entire image. All rendering should be implemented into your illustrations, into your artwork, with the intent on being describing form, various textures, and materials. That's really it. you know. And you're doing all of that within the context of how that character is being lit. And if you can do those things right, correctly, consciously, you know, always have in mind where that major light source is within the scene and from what direction it's projecting down onto the character from, and you'll be good to go, man, like, you'll be a-okay. It's, a uh, a lot of the time, you'll be sitting here looking at an illustration like this, come together, wondering how I'm making all these decisions, and a lot of those decisions are just predetermined from the considerations I'm making toward those, the, the lighting, and, uh, and the textures and the materials and the forms that I'm dealing with. And those are the main things I keep in mind when I'm rendering. I think about always, constantly, for as long as that rendering takes, where the light source is within the scene, what form I'm working with, and its surface qualities, the material and the texture that it is covered with. And those elements... Those considerations are what allows me to make the decisions I make. That's what tells me where to place each and every hatch, how to shape it. And uh, and yeah, as long as I, I keep them in mind at all times, I'm usually going to be able to stay on track. So I'd suggest the same thing to you. Like, you know, this stuff, it appears complicated to the outside eye. But once you get to understand why these decisions are made in the order in which they're made. It becomes very easy. It becomes just a a process of of going through the motions of the drawing until that illustration is complete. And you'll get there eventually. It takes a little bit of time. There's no way of getting around that. But as long as you stick with it, you will eventually 
reach a point where that illustration can be called done, and it'll it'll pull together all right. <laughs> You'll do a pretty good job with it. So, um, you know, study things like form, study lighting. That's what I'm telling you. If if you want to get good at this stuff, if you want to be able to render in the same way that I'm rendering now, learn anatomy for one. Learn the, actually learn the forms that anatomy involves, right? So you don't just want to be able to draw the contours of the muscles, all right? You don't just want to know where all the muscles go. You actually want to understand their form, their dimension, right? Their surface, you know, what kind of curve does it have? How much, uh, how much mass does it, does it have? You know what I mean? Like, you don't, it, it, the muscles aren't just lines that are drawn across the body. You know, we're not working with, have you ever seen those, those muscle t-shirts? You know, they've got like the abs drawn on them and the pictorial muscles, right? And you wear them and you kind of look like a beefcake. But the thing is, is that you don't want your characters to look like that. You don't just want it to look like the muscles are drawn on. You actually want there to be form within them and you want those textures to be there study up on textures and materials how do you render them out in a comic book stylistic way because you know that's what's going to allow you to become a better and better comic book illustrator a better character designer and allow you to come to a conclusion to every single illustration that you set out to do that is satisfactory for your audience but more importantly for you the biggest critic of your artwork. At least for most of us, that is indeed the case. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this drawing demonstration, that you got a ton of value out of it, that you learned a lot. I highly suggest that you take some of the advice I shared with you on board, study those forms, study the anatomy, study uh, the lighting, and uh, you know, practice it. Come up with little exercises that you can do to make sure that you properly put into practice and 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 absorb that knowledge. And then you'll be able to apply it to your own character designs, like I did here for Goliath. If you'd like more comic art tips, tricks, and tutorials, be sure to visit www.howtodrawcomics.net. Over on the site, you'll find a ton of written tutorials, video tutorials. We've even got a podcast. And then when you're ready to take your comic art skill set to the next level, I highly suggest that you visit our store and check out our premium selection of courses. All right, that's it. Until next time, keep on creating, keep on drawing, and I'll see you in the next video.